actually played on these recordings is a source of heated controversy in many jazz circles. Now, a pair of gumshoes from North Carolina are using everyday software to place the musician with their melodies. Rick Lockridge explains. Jazz great Vic Spiderbeck played a lot of memorable solos before the bootleg gin got to him and killed him before his 29th birthday. But did he play this solo? This and many other mystery recordings from the early days of jazz have given aficionados something to argue about for 80 years. But now, a pair of self-styled jazz detectives think technology can help them solve some of those mysteries. Now, this is the one we think is probably Big Spider-Man. Tom Smith, music professor and jazz trombonist, says it's time to set the record straight about a lot of records. There didn't seem to be enough attention paid to detail in jazz history, and a lot of times it became, as one of my professors once said, the lie that was agreed upon. Oh, baby, won't you please come home? During the Prohibition era, Smith says, record producers often tried to pass off the work of unknown imitators as the product of stars like Biderbeck, and largely they got away with it. At that time, people never really believed that jazz recordings would be anything that anyone would care about 40 or 50 years and down the line. But recent advances in voice recognition technology convinced Smith and research partner Gary Westbrook that there must be a way to measure every horn player's unique voice or tone. The things that are going to make you and I sounding different on the same instrument different is just the makeup of our face, the makeup of our uh, chambers of our body, the diaphragm, the amount of breath support that we're capable of bringing to the sound. The pair settled on sound wave analysis software by Spectra Plus, usually used to test loudspeakers. Software measures frequency, low notes on the left, high on the right, and loudness. How loud are you at certain frequencies? That's your tone. Westbrook randomly samples each mystery soloist three times, then compares the data with a known soloist on another recording. There's no statistical difference between the two. But the colorful characters from the early age of jazz often seem to be trying to evade detection. Take this second solo from the same recording. Listen for the obvious missed note. Would a great cornetist like Bix botch it that badly? Smith says it's possible. He was a chronic alcoholic. He had a lot of emotional problems. I think Bix would probably be very embarrassed by it all. He probably thought 20 years after his death, no one would ever listen to him play again. And it... But he was wrong. And Smith says it's important to solve all mystery recording cases now, not just to give the musicians their due, but because, he says, it'll be important to future music lovers to have an accurate history of that extraordinary era. Otherwise, th this, is, this is going to be guesswork forever, and the lie that is agreed upon will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so on the campus of tiny Pfeiffer University, north of Charlotte, Jazz detectives prepare to publish their findings and prepare for the controversy that will surely follow because they know there are a lot of jazz lovers who hold strong opinions. They've already heard from some of them, but they are determined to put some of those old records in order. Rick Lockridge, Tech TV, Meisenheimer, North Carolina.